Good evening. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us today at NAC's home program at the National Arts Club. My name is Ken Dow, and I am the chair of the architecture committee. For those of you who are not familiar with the National Arts Club, we're a 501c3 nonprofit based in New York City with a mission to stimulate, foster, and promote public interest in the arts. Annually, the club offers more than 150 free programs to the public, including exhibitions, theatrical and musical performances, lectures, and readings. For more information about the National Arts Club, you can visit us at nationalartsclub.org or find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. On behalf of our architecture committee, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the segregation by the design. Following the discussion will be a brief Q&A, so please feel free to use the Q&A function for any questions you might have. Uh, we have a slightly shorter program today, so please ask questions. Um, we would love to have an expanded uh, Q&A program. Um, this is an interesting subject, so um, please put it in your and we will get all of them. Um, the end of the hour. All right. And without further introduce, further ado, let me introduce our speaker. Program. Using colorized and remastered historic photography, segregation by design documents the intentional destruction of communities of color due to federal policies of redlining, urban renewal, and freeway construction. Through stark before and after comparisons, cartographic primary sources, and demographic data, segregation by design will reveal the extent to which the American city was mythically hollowed out based on race. The project will cover roughly 180 municipalities which were redlined by the FHA and received federal funding for urban renewal. Speaker Adam Paul Kuznick holds a master's of architecture degree from Columbia University and focuses on addressing historic inequity and ongoing climate issues through urban planning and architecture. Without further ado, we are very happy to present this program and have Adam with us here tonight. Excellent. So, hey, everybody. Um, my name is Adam Paul Sesenik. Um, I run the project um, Segregation by Design, uh, in which um, I am trying to document, um, as, as Shen said, the extent to which um, the American city was hollowed out uh, through policy means based on race. Um, my plan is to cover roughly 180 cities um, that were given funding um, for urban renewal uh, and slum clearance, as well as federal uh, interstate construction. Um, so let me present my screen. So what I'm going to do today is basically do an overview of this history, um, but I'm going to be starting with in the present, um, starting with the problems that are presently posed by freeways, um, and then I'm going to explain how we got here uh, historically. Um, and then go on to explain what cities are making progress and actually um, uh, solving some of these problems. So um, I'm going to start again in the present in Houston. So Houston is encircled by interstates, which divide the cities along racial lines. Um, rather than pursuing ways to lessen this divide, the city is actually spending $10 billion dollars to widen the highways uh, in the project seen here. The red is the right of way of the expansion. Um, the Clayton Homes seen here, um, a public housing facility housing mostly black and Latino residents will be torn down for this plan, um, displacing roughly 500 families um, in addition to 500 more displaced um, from market rate housing. Um, this project would forcibly relocate over a thousand families, demolish roughly 340 businesses, uh, 150 houses, five churches, and two schools. Uh, Texas has already started this relocation. Um, since the mid 
20th century urban highway construction like this has worked as a powerful tool to segregate American cities and demolish communities of color. Uh, these roadways built on the legacy of redlining, creating walls of concrete and smog that took the red lines off the map and built them in reality, separating black and brown communities from white. While this period of government-led segregation is often discussed as history, um, projects like this one in Texas and ongoing ones in Southern California, uh, Portland, Oregon, Shreveport, Louisiana, and Austin, Texas reveal that um, this is anything but history. Uh, what's more, for the communities that remain divided by these roads, a considerable public health impacts exist. So this is the South Bronx. Um, up here at the top is noise pollution, which maps very cleanly onto the interstate network. You can see um, the deep purple is over 90 decibels, which is louder than a vacuum cleaner. And there's tens of thousands of people who live along this freeway. Um, and it's no coincidence that within the South Bronx encircled by this ring of freeways, uh, basically all of the census tracts are within the 99th percentile uh, for prevalence of asthma. Uh, and I, I worked with um, the Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia on this chart. Um, and it's also been linked to uh, increased rates of uh, lung cancer as well. So in addition, at this point, decades of ed evidence has shown that widening highways does very little to actually relieve traffic anyway. Uh, and in some cases can actually make it worse by encouraging more people to take that route. Um, rather, so, excuse me. Um, so rather than being the rare exception, Texas projects like Texas fit a longstanding pattern of how the United States chooses to force highways through communities with the least political power to resist while continuing to use this outdated toolkit um, that just continually produces the same result, which is more and more traffic. So now I'm going to discuss sort of how we got here. This is the history. Um, so it begins with the Cross Bronx Expressway. So the first of these urban interstates was the Cross Bronx Expressway built shortly after World War II. Uh, it was designed by Robert Moses and it was the first urban highway in the United States to be built through a built up area. And it wasn't just any built up area, he built it through New York City. Um, this project displaced roughly 40,000 people, uh, making it the most disruptive, 60,000 people, excuse me, 60,000 people, making it the most disruptive single infrastructure project in United States history. And that's not to, and that those numbers don't, don't count the, the subsequent destruction from um, the urban renewal projects as well. So let me just switch. I can sh show you. So here is a graphic of the Cross Bronx being built. So what this is, just a note on process. So what I do in this project is I take um, historic aerial photos. These were typically taken from Army Air Force surveys. And uh, I stitch them together, colorize them, and make them, the, the idea is to make them directly comparable to um, what we're used to seeing on Google Maps um, and to show the extent of the destruction. So let me switch back. So um, unfortunately, the Cross Bronx served as a direct model for other cities looking to develop, this is Philadelphia, looking to develop their own highway networks after President Eisenhower signed the Federal Aid Highway Act in 1956. Um, this bill provided a 90% federal match for freeway construction. 
So what that means or what that meant is if you were a municipality and you were doing a road project, if after this bill passed, if you were to then upgrade your road project, if you were to make that road to federal freeway standards, the federal government would then step in and pay for 90% of that freeway. Uh, and that actually represents the largest uh, individual uh, direct investment from the federal government in the built environment of city of American cities uh, in history. Um, so that bill in large part explains the very similar nature of the freeway construction that we see in cities around the country um, and how they cut up downtowns. So again, Philadelphia, Boston, Chicago, And it's not just old cities. Uh, it, it's not just the um, you know sort of pre what we typically think of as the pre automobile cities that that were affected by this. This is Houston. Um, Houston at one point was a walkable city, streetcar based city, um, but the it was surrounded by this loop of freeways that again continues to plague it to this day. Buffalo, another example, Atlanta of uh, a city that we typically think of as, as sort of growing up in the automobile age, but in fact, Atlanta grew up as a railroad hub. So the real estate industry's widespread use of what were called restrictive covenants ensured um, that these highways that cut across downtowns and led to the development of new suburbs on the, ex on, on the outskirts of cities, it ensured that these new, these new suburbs were whites only. So these these um, new high, these new highways sliced through downtown areas, uh, and again made possible the development of these new suburbs. And that, in combination with the practice of restrictive covenants, um, encouraged and exacerbated uh, white flight. Um, so this is an example again, Levittown. This is on this was on Long Island, but the, these were universal across the country from Miami to Portland, Oregon, to Minneapolis, to Houston, to San Francisco, San Jose, Los Angeles. Um, these were everywhere. Um, and again, this practice uh, encouraged white flight, encouraged and exacerbated white flight and racial segregation and created or helped create a white suburbia outside of cities accessed by these new highways. So American cities around this time entered a period of significant decay as tax bases dried up and cities cut back on municipal services. And thus begins the era of um, urban renewal. Um, so urban renewal was another federally sponsored program. Um, so this was, so the federal government using the 1949 um, Federal Housing Act, provided a two-thirds federal match for what they called slum clearance and urban renewal. Um, so cities used this bill, and they used the decay caused by um, the freeways and white flight as an excuse to remake their civic cores for the convenience of suburban white commuters. So this is an example in Boston. The West End um, was an Italian and Black neighborhood that was completely leveled uh, for an expansion, um, primarily of um, Massachusetts General Hospital, uh, as well as um, many government facilities. So black neighborhoods were targeted with such regularity for urban renewal projects uh, that uh, James Baldwin said at the time, um, urban renewal means Negro removal. That's what it means. And the federal government is an accomplice to this fact. So what this chart is showing is that these urban renewal projects almost always disproportionately affected communities of color. So if you see here, one second. Thank you. So if you see here, what this chart is showing is that in a city like Philadelphia, where the non-white population was roughly 20%, about 70% of those displaced in urban renewal were non-white. Similarly with Atlanta, in 1950, the share of the population that was non-white was in the mid-30s, but the population that was displaced 
was almost 85% non-white. So cities paved over vibrant neighborhoods and replaced them with amenities focused on suburban communities. In this case, in Boston, uh, a government facility, a police station, as well as a municipal court uh, and lots of parking. Um, in this example in particular, uh, in Roxbury, in, in South Boston, this is the Dudley Square, Nubian Square area. Uh, roughly 2,600 families were displaced or about 8,600 people in 1960. Uh, in addition to the church being demolished, um, and the church was led by um, Reverend Michael T. Haynes. It had a black congregation. Um, that I have more information about this on my website. But in addition to the church being demolished, all the housing, the subway was ripped out. Um, and rerouted around the neighborhood. Here's another example in Chicago. Um, this is the Cabrini Green area. This is on the near north side of Chicago, a neighborhood that was demolished and replaced with projects. Um, far fewer units of housing were rebuilt after this was demolished. Uh, another example in Atlanta, um, so this is an, this is an example of the sort of type of entertainment facility that was built often in downtowns. Um, this was the neighborhood called Mechanicsville, uh, in which the neighborhood was first demolished for this freeway interchange, and then later demolished for the Fulton County Stadium, which itself was later demolished as stadia rapidly become obsolete. Um, another element of this is the destruction of um, rail transit. Uh, as the highway poured so much money into highways, uh, it led to the demise of electric rail transit. And in addition, the destruction of the neighborhoods that these systems served um, through urban renewal um, led to them being outmoded in a lot of ways. So these are some examples this is Philadelphia, this is the Bronx. Oakland. Chicago. So as the government, or as, as suburbanization happened, these systems became less and less used. And now we spend billions of dollars recreating a small fraction of what we had. This is Houston. Again, showing that even what we think of as typically uh, as, as typically auto-oriented cities did not necessarily grow up that way. Syracuse. Um, so now looking forward, it's not all doom and gloom. There are some cities that are making progress. Uh, here on the left is um, Utrecht uh, in the Netherlands, and on the right is Seoul uh, in um, South Korea. So other countries have realized that we can't keep doubling down on expanding these freeways. Um, they're bad for the environment and they also don't work well for transportation. Here on the left, again, an example in the Netherlands in which a historic canal was paved over for a roadway um, and then later unpaved um, and brought back to its former glory. Uh, and in addition, in order to reduce the demand for cars, they invested heavily in, um, in uh, parallel bike lanes and transit lanes. And the same here in Seoul, this was an elevated highway that capped a tributary of the Han River. Um, it's difficult to find good pictures of this because uh, I, I think they don't want us to find it. Uh, it's, it's difficult. Um, but so they, they paved over this, they, they demolished this highway and daylighted a river that had been um, paved over, and now it's one of the most popular attractions in Seoul. Um, and in addition, they, in order to reduce the demand from the highway, they built two parallel metro lines. So it's, it's not just a matter of removing the highway, but it's also providing that alternative form of transportation. And then here in the United States, we actually have a great example. So this is Rochester, New York. Um, so you can see here where this highway used to make a full loop around the city. It was an elevated highway that cut off 
the primarily black, the um, historically heart of the black community in Rochester. It was originally a Freeman's town, started in the late 1700s. Rochester's very old, but it was divided by this freeway, by uh, this being New York State. It was designed by Robert Moses. Sorry to um, interrupt, uh, Adam, but we're not seeing Rochester. The, the oh, I public apologize. Sorry. Apologies. Let me. Here we go. How about now? Yeah. yeah. Great. So. Um, what I was saying is this inner loop used to make a full loop around inner Rochester, dividing the outer neighborhoods from downtown. Um, but they have since removed the highway, filled it in, and in fact built housing on the site. And what's cool is you can see this. This happened so recently that you can actually go to Google Maps and do this. So you can see this is where as recently as 2012, the sunken structure used to be dividing this neighborhood from the CBD. Um, and they filled it in and built some affordable housing, not as much as they should have, but it is a very good project. Um, and they did not bury the roadway like Boston did, um, which is sort of burying the problem. Uh, and, and if people have questions about that, I'm happy to talk about that. Um, but what they did was they removed the highway, they restitched the grid back together, and the city is coming back to life. It's, it's, it's very fascinating. Um, and nearby in Syracuse, another Bob Moses project is being torn down. The I-81, which cut off the 15th ward over here from downtown is being demolished. They, they have a plan now to demolish with federal funding. So very exciting. So I'll stop there. And if people have questions, I'm happy to take them. And that's my first question before I ask everybody else is, is you said you studied um, 180 um, neighborhoods. Um, so tell me some of the other, um, you can't list them all. So I'm curious. Um, so not neighborhoods. So let me show you. The plan is 180 cities that got money from those two bills that I mentioned. So the 49 Housing Act, which provided two-thirds um, federal funding for slum clearance and urban renewal, and then the 56 Freeway Bill, which provided the 90% funding for highways. Um, so between those two bills, roughly 180 cities um, were covered, uh, were, were given money for that. Um, I have covered uh, these, <laughs> so about 12. Um, but if you go to the site, I have a full list here on the right, um, of all the cities it's, I mean, it's, it's 180. So it's, it's every city. Um, it's, it's, it's quite astounding that the, the, um, scale of this project, uh, that, uh, on the part of the federal government. Um, so, so far I've done Atlanta, Boston, Buffalo, I am splitting New York up into five, um, Chicago, DC. Minneapolis, Oakland, Houston, Providence, Syracuse, Philadelphia. Um, and were you going to, I, I might have missed it somehow, but were you going to show the sort of uh, video or animation of the cross rocks being built? I mean, I, I know we're a national program, but I think, you know, I'm, I'm curious. And, you know. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Oh, I'm sorry. Did that video not play? I must have. I think that same maybe thing. Maybe I just missed it. Maybe it was that. Um, oh my gosh! Here we go. We had with Rochester, where. Um, yeah, sorry, I meant it. Okay. I was talking, and no one. All right. <laughs> no yeah, this is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This. Is, this is what I meant to show. Yes. Right. right. So when I was discussing the process, that's what I was saying. Um, these are these are aerial photos that I. Uh, remaster, colorize, and then um, match up with present day.
And I think um, I will say this just because I read it and I found it fascinating. Um, even if you just read the chapter, um, um, it gives you a, a very detailed sort of explanation about what happened and um, yeah, I'm losing you. I think I can't hear you quite well, but I think you were talking about um, the power broker, um, which I can actually see behind you there. Um, so, indeed, the the he has a. The, if, if for those of you who have read the power broker, um, the there's a whole um, chapter called the One Mile that's about this neighborhood, East Tremont, which you can see here that very much gets hollowed out by the, the cross Bronx. Um, it might be better to show it this way. Mr. Biden, tear, there we go. So this is my New York Times article. Uh, okay, let me stop sharing for one second, filling it up. Okay, great. All right. Well, let's launch straight into the, the Q&A. Um, this first question is from Linda. Uh, Maryland Governor Larry Hogan has been moving forward with plans to widen and I-495 in order to add toll lanes. However, the population near these roads are mostly Caucasian and higher income as far as I know. What is, is this situation an outlier in the U.S.? Not necessarily. Sorry, I missed the beginning of it. So that this was N Annapolis, you said? Uh, no. Um, Maryland. Okay, well, so... Um, Actually, I'm not sure what city, now that I... Now that yeah, I, I mean, Larry, Larry Hogan is... Uh, it, it, it's it's not an anomaly. Um, it, the, he, you said they were adding HOV lanes. Um, it's, you're expanding it. Yeah, it's just um, it's just uh, futile, is what it is. Um, because uh, as I briefly touched upon with induced demand, uh, the nature of freeway widening is such that we it, it's not going to work. Um, we we have decades of evidence of this at that point. Um, it brings more drivers to the road. It attracts more development, um, such that in a couple of years you're right back at capacity. And it's just a jump. It's just a geometry problem. Um, it's it's a, it's a, it's a the nature of automobile transportation is such that um, it, it scales uh, geometrically. Um, so the more people you add, the, I think the, the that's, more. Yeah, scale. that's kind of like um, we've seen it. It's almost like we should know it, but we've, we've heard about it in, in planning and stuff like that. And what's frustrating about Why Larry Hope, ways? Sorry. Freeways does not like, reduce traffic. Actually. Exactly. And what's frustrating in Maryland in particular is um, they recently canceled a, a subway project in Baltimore. This was Governor Hogan. Uh, and a lot of the money was redirected specifically towards suburban road construction around Annapolis. I'm not sure if that's the same as what we were just discussing. But it's just emblematic of the same type of uh, project that we have been doing for so long that A, disproportionately affects communities of color, and then B, does not solve the traffic problem. Um, it, it doesn't get us to where we're trying to go. So what exactly are we doing there? And, and, and in the case of the, the canceled light rail line in Baltimore, that was a pretty cut and dry. The, the NAACP actually sued um, saying that it was violating the Civil Rights Act because of the, commun the communities it was going to go through. It, it, yeah, that, that's a mess in, in Maryland. Uh, All right, well, I think, I think actually, you know... Yeah, Shen, your, your connection isn't... Oh, really? Oh, boy. Yeah, sorry, that's why I keep saying it. <laughs> um, how about... But I screw up a bunch of times. How about more on burying the problem, please? It's, for instance, Boston... Yeah, it's, there's a lot of well, questions about that. Yeah, I mean, and again, you know, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but it's 
what that what Boston did was they spent billions and billions of dollars basically just rebuilding the exact same highway underground. Um, and they, it, it, at, at its core, that was a highway widening project, uh, which is just the same thing that I was, it, it's the same thing I was talking about. It doesn't solve the problem. And in the case of Boston, all it does is continue to induce people to drive to the heart of, into the heart of downtown Boston when there are much better transit options that we should be encouraging people to do and it's it, 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 it is literally just bearing the problem it, it, seattle is doing the same thing um with the alaskan way viaduct replacement it it, it doesn't work I mean, you know guess, boston hasn't it's uh, yeah what were we gonna say i was gonna say i think you know um yes these questions are all similar, like burying the problem, um, a lot of questions about that in Boston. Well, and again, the issue with Boston because is what, it's... what is the solution? Um, or a little, I mean, the cat's, the cat's out of the bag, right? Or Pandora's box has been opened and... Um, Not necessarily. Well, because again, the solution is, is, is more like, again, what Rochester did. Rochester is a smaller city, so that's a different example, but you can look at Seoul, not exactly a small city. And what they did was they removed the highway, they changed the land use around the highway to encourage transit oriented. It's I these simple these solutions sound so simple. Um it, but it's really not rocket science. It's they they removed the highway, they changed the land use to encourage more density around the newly built subways they built parallel to that route. Um and in addition, the fact that they had just built this new tourist attraction helped, didn't, didn't hurt. Um, but what Boston did was put an arterial road on top of a freeway. The Rose Kennedy Greenway is better than what was there, uh, but it's still difficult to cross it still creates a clear barrier between the North End and downtown. It, it, you can't build on it because it is a deck. Uh, you, like Rochester is doing building an apartment on top, building apartments on top. It, you can't really do that on top of a freeway because you need ventilation. Um, that's actually the biggest one is ventilation and emergency exits. But it, it's the freeways are very tricky, delicate, difficult, pieces of infrastructure that aren't well suited to urban environments. It's really as simple as that. But it's even, even in New York, it's difficult to imagine them removing. Is it? You know. Does Manhattan, I mean, Manhattan has the FDR and Riverside, but it doesn't have crosstown freeways. It, 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 what I find very interesting is the, is the comparison of what was built in the Bronx versus what wasn't built in Manhattan and the nature of who was protesting. I mean, I obviously love, adore Jane Jacobs, but she was able to muster more political power because of her station, because of where she was um, and because of the color of her skin. And it's a very similar story in San Francisco versus Oakland. Uh, San Francisco was able to stop much of the planned freeways, particularly one through Russian Hill, whereas Oakland, no. Oakland was divided. West Oakland was cut off from downtown and completely surrounded. Um, I've got off, so, but, I've but gotten other, away from the question here, but yeah, yeah, it's it's, it's like I guess like um, I I think this is a, a, a very it's you know, cutting you know I think the activity of um, on the on the highways or freeways is, a, is something that's hard to imagine not being there. So could you talk about that? You know, getting from sort of like north to south um, on surface roads or that kind of thing. Um, it seems to be some of the, the factors. 
Sorry, I did. The I think you were asking the the density and transit. I think is the answer to what you were saying. Um, but mm -hmm. I, you were breaking up a bit. Um, but there there are pla like many examples of places that have removed highways uh, and life has gone on and been 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 better. Uh, again, the, the, the example in Utrecht, but if you want big cities, um, look at Paris. Paris had two freeways running along the Seine and they weren't, they were freeways shoehorned onto what used to be historic docks, but they were freeways, limited access. They had rebuilt a lot of it, um, for automobiles, but, uh, the mayor and Hidalgo beginning in the mid 2010s, um, has slowly reclaimed the entire Sand waterfront, and for anyone who's been there recently, it's 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 fantastic. And you ask Parisians about it, and they do remember. And some of them are annoyed by it, um, but you know that 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 is what it is. But um, they remember what it was like before, and now now it's different. And they they've again they beef, they've beefed up uh, the 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 critical the key here is as they are dismantling these things. They're not just dismantling them and saying, oh, okay, it's up to you. Um, they're providing, because that, that's, that's not right either. I mean, the fact of the matter is many people in America are forced to drive, but what these places that have been successful have done um, have invested in alternatives. It, it's, and, and those are walkability through more dense housing around transit um, and then increased you know, better transit and bikeability, it, 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 et cetera. It, it's so, I mean, Seoul is probably the best example for a big city. Um, Rochester is different because again, it's, it's sort of, it's changed significantly um, since it's, yeah, since it's heyday. Um, but there, there are many international examples. Again, you trek to Paris. Look at Madrid. Madrid had a Madrid had a road that ran along the the, the river there. Um, they buried some of it, but most of they most of it they were removed and again invested in metro. Um, so, yeah, I mean that's great. So I think basically you're saying the the answer has been just a little a lot less in three ways and a lot more. And, solution yes, and that kind of thing. We have so, uh, we have a lot more questions, so I'm gonna and some are still pouring in, so I'm gonna try. To... Yeah, if you see the chat yeah, there, if, I, if I'm not if I'm breaking up, maybe um, it would be good if Nadine jumps on and uh, asks the questions. Um, but I'll, I'll try this one now, and, and if it's not working technically, I think um, you know we should we should. Um, yeah. Next one is from Ellie. Um, how much do you wind up connecting with local community elders, leaders, and planners to talk about the past, present, and future? Any highlights to share? Um, yeah, definitely. So I, the Bronx, oh, not as much as I would like, but um, it's something that I'm planning on doing more. I've been speaking in particular with community groups in Houston who are fighting that ongoing expansion. Um, that's a little different. That's not community elders. Those, cause that that's, these are sort of young activists who are um, again, fighting for the future of Houston. Um, that's not to say that elders don't do that as well, but um, in the Bronx in particular, I've been speaking with this group loving the Bronx net led by Nilka Martell um, and she's fantastic. She's connected me with a bunch of people who, I mean, they're really sad stories. So I can't, well, it, they're very sad stories. It, it's, it's something I've been meaning to incorporate more um, because a lot of these folks are like very much still alive. Um, and uh, it would be, I think so incredible to have firsthand accounts and, uh, put that to these pictures. Um, so the, the, yeah. the answer to the question is a little bit in the Bronx. Um, 
but I've been meaning to do it in more places. Um, I've actually, I, you know what? I actually just spoke with um, the other day, uh, Anita Wilkerson from um, Where Is My Land. Um, so she did, she she helped the that group in San, uh, Venice, Manhattan Beach get Bruce's Beach back. Um, so for folks who aren't familiar with that story, um, I don't know the ins and outs of it, but it was a, a, a black owned beach, um, like a resort and the government appropriated it through eminent domain uh and after many decades of legal battles they finally gotten their land back so that's that's why she started this group where's my land um so with her we're potentially well, that's very nebulous but we're talking about potentially um trying to find more of these people who have these um not just memories i mean like cases i don't know like uh literally cases like, you know but yeah all right next question were displaced people compensated in any way yeah so they were compensated uh they, they were required just compensation um so they were given well it really depends on the city in the example of the cross bronx uh they were given market rate but market rate had been really deflated by the fact that they knew the highway was coming through. So it was kind of a, and it was kind of like a, a self, Robert Moses knew what he was doing. Um, but in, and then in a lot of the other cities, um, the, the prices were artificially deflated again, due to the fact that they knew the freeway was coming through. That's what happened in South street in Philadelphia, lots of Detroit, um, the Roxbury in Boston, um, but a lot of it has to do with the fact that the market rate was very much manipulated by practices like redlining, obviously, um, by the presence of restrictive covenants, by who was doing the appraising. It 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 was the, the answer is yeah, they were compensated. They were they were required to have just compensation, but the it was the people doing the it was a, a very flawed institution. It's very well explained in the power broker, actually, um, the nature of how they paid these people for their homes to some extent. All right. Um, next question. And, oh, sorry. And then people who rented, they got nothing. The people who rented got a letter about 90 days before saying, well, in some cases, 90, if they were lucky, the people who rented got absolutely nothing. Um, okay. Which, and, 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 and everybody what, had to find something new. Right? So. Well, and one of the problems was that the it was black neighborhoods that were targeted with such intensity that they ended up not having many. The the housing was just gone at a certain point. You know, there was no place to go um, because they had demolished so much and, and built rebuilt projects um, or nothing. Okay. Uh, so from Isabel, uh, this video is astonishing. You mentioned Oakland. Is anything positive happening there? Well, let me show you, if you give me one second, because I had wanted to show the Oakland video, because that's a really good one. Um, there might be something positive happening there. That I, I that, worked, uh, my, our, our firm relocated to um, .com boom. So while you locate that, I'll, I'll it's nostalgic about 20 years ago. Um, yeah. And we um, went from just a really not that great um, um, office space, um, regular office space, to a beautiful space in downtown Oakland. Um, oh, nice. And beautiful downtown. Uh, Oakland is, 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 I think, um, coming back. And I mean, you know, even then was coming back, and I feel like even more now. Yeah. And go bears. So this is Oakland. So this is 980 being built here. So 980 cut really through the residential heart. Oh my gosh. 
of Oakland. Yeah, and you can see the the land use really changes quite a bit. It, it's also because the what's interesting is the before the the thirty eight photo the, the photos from the thirties were often taken from like literal biplanes, so they're with cameras attached to them. Um, so the the quality is sometimes a little better uh, from the thirties and the eighties uh, from the early satellites. Um, so Oakland. So like the Bay Area, there's always a lot of plans floating around. Um, it, there's nothing really concrete, actually, is to say that, that, that w- what should happen is they should remove Oakland or remove um, 980, reconnect West Oakland to downtown. And there's a there's a group pushing for that connect Oakland. Um, they're semi active. Um, and then Scott, uh, Scott Wiener, the um, state senator from uh, San Francisco is He's great. He's always pushing for removing 980. He's, um, it's like Cato saying, and furthermore, Carthage must be destroyed. He's, it, it's, it's good. Um, so there's, uh, people know what they need to do. And like we, the, 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 they know what they need to do in Oakland, which is remove 980 and then drop in a BART line and then build a second Trans Bay tube that stops in Alameda and then connects up with the Trans Bay terminal and then goes to town Kerry. But, um, We'll see if they do that, but there's good leadership out. Sorry, does anyone? That was great. That was a great answer. I uh, hopefully. You know, Sorry, it, it, I left YouTube. I left YouTube open, and it started playing something that was very startling. They have good leadership in the Bay Area, sort of. Some good leaders, and so I'm sort of optimistic about the Bay. Check out Connect Oakland to the person who asked that. They're good. Great. All right. Um, oh, I think you already answered this. Um, you see similar patterns outside of the U.S. And maybe that question relates to the, the Canada. Well, so so similar. Sorry, you broke up again. So similar patterns outside the U.S. Um, definitely. So, um, Toronto, uh, is, it's very similar. Um, and Montreal to some extent, not Vancouver, but Toronto, um, there's actually, we, we share a lot of the same, um, sort of segregationist, uh, history, uh, with Canada. Um, there's a, a lot of the, um, policies, uh, around urban renewal and the nature of slum clearance were originated by this uh, Canadian um, Harlan Bartholomew, um, who there's a great 99% visible episode called The Missing Middle that came out recently about it, um, that it was very much about the ra- racialization of, of certain types of housing, um, of, of basically uh, apartment buildings and dense housing. Um, that is to say, Canada is very similar. Um, other examples around the world, that's something I've been meaning to look into more. Um, Canada is obviously similar. Um, two really big examples that are I, I want to spend some time on significantly eventually are obviously Johannesburg and Cape Town because um, they had a similar type of philosophy um, and, to, and did use... Uh, highways as explicitly as segregate. What's fun about them is they were much more explicit, not fun, sorry. But what's interesting about them from a research point of view is they're much more explicit about it. So it's easier to just say, wow. Um, So those two, and then um, London, I know has some examples with the West Way, but it's something I need to look into more. Uh, But there certainly are examples. It's not just America, obviously. Um, this is an interesting question. Um, no oblique picture. Was it for segregation or what they felt to be progress since automobiles were the industrial revolution sweetheart? How would you elevate slum neighborhoods at this time and place? What was the second part of that? Oh, I think the question is what would you do? 
how would you elevate slum neighborhoods at this time and place? But how would you, um, since the vehicle seemed to be this idea was that this would also help urban urban renewal, right? Yeah. So I think the question is, how would you how would you like do or well, so the question of, 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 you know, whether or not th there was, you know, people did see the car as modern and there was uh, much of what I'm discussing is tied up in the idea of capital M modernism. Um, but if you look at the provenance of that, much of that is explicitly racist. Um, but that's a different issue. But as to how you would do urban renewal without some clearance is it was that the because they're sorry i think that was i think maybe that's perhaps slightly outside of your purview well but... no because there's great examples of that um sorry mm -hmm. well so no, no, let no. me share let me share my screen again um i'll go back to the presentation so what's interesting is i'm trying to find boston so Boston, so zoom in. So this neighborhood here with the West End that was completely destroyed. So I showed that aerial image of it. There's basically a totally identical neighborhood right here called the North End that was not destroyed and survives now. Um, and the difference is, A, the demographics, and B, there were much more historical, well, what we considered to be historic back then. Uh, but this neighborhood has since become, or has gone back to being residential and is now one of the most desirable places in the city. It's sort of very touristy. And there's a, there's a very similar example in Philadelphia of um, Society Hill. Uh, a neighborhood that, it, 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 I guess, perhaps this is a little outside of my purview, but there's Philadelphia. If you look at the example, Society Hill, I, I hate to point to that as like a positive example, but there, that that is an example of um, taking a neighborhood that they did consider a slum, uh, but rather than demolishing it wholesale respecting the existing community and environment and fixing it and just taking care of it. it, it what's frustrating is, you know, a lot of what they were, and one of the reasons I uh, like to do the colorization is because a lot of what they are describing as slums were not, you know, they were virtually indistinguishable from the blocks that survive. You know, if you see when, when you're, Walking in Manhattan and you see the cruciform towers, the 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 NYCHA towers, um, and you look across the street and you see the regular um, new new law tenements and and old law tenements. That what they were demolishing was new law tenements, and and it, they if we had taken care of them, they would have been this. We would have had them still. It's it's yeah. It's, I'm not sure if I quite answered that question, but no, the, the, I think it's good. I think there's a big there's a big discussion about how to even the uh, you know. Well, and a lot of it was tied up again in this idea of modernism that that viewed the city um, as like a a like a traffic problem, but then b as sort of an outmoded, unhealthy way of living. Um, and they sought to sort of reject urbanism itself rather than respectfully build on it. And in America, you know, it was perhaps easier where we don't have so much of our identity tied up in the architecture, for instance, like the Parisian, you know, the French do or something, or the, the Dutch. Um, it's, you know, it's, it was perhaps easier to, to sort of sell that. I mean, great. Um, great question here from Emma Rogers. What city that you haven't heard yet are you most looking forward to looking at? Thank you, Emma. Um, that's my wife. Sorry. <laughs> um, 
So that's a great question. Um, I'm doing, this is a bit of a spoiler. So for folks who follow me on Instagram, I go one city at a time. I'm doing Chicago right now. Um, I'm doing Miami next, um, which Miami has, Miami has a history. <laughs> uh, people, South, South Florida actually does have a history separate from, you know, what we hear in the media. Um, what city? I, that's a really good question, actually. Um, I'm very excited for probably Brooklyn. I mean, that's a little selfish, you know, because um, I have so much experience with it. But Brooklyn and Queens is going to be a big one. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do those together because that makes sense geographically. Because um, the BQE is sort of the main driver of that one. I really, I, the, the, the Cross Bronx and the BQE, the two, I mean, those are Bob, or those are the, the two big urban Robert Moses highways. And they they really did, as I mentioned, serve as a model, um, not just for rights of way, but how you interact with the people you're displacing. It, it, this is discussed very well in the power broker, how you set up these agencies um, to, 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 Set to um, provide the the just compensation, um, and then you know who you hire for that. It, it, it's it's those two are very interesting. So I guess I'm I'm very excited for all of them because what's interesting is I go into because I don't really know anything other than you know um, Miami, South Florida, where I'm from originally, um, and then New York, where you know spend a lot of time and then Oakland where I went to school or Berkeley, et cetera. Like those I know very well, but other than those, I don't really know these, like I didn't know Chicago at all going into it, but it's kind of fun. Um, just starting with those old aerial photos because they're very objective to the, to the extent anything is, but they are, I mean, that they're, they're photographs. Um, you know, a map is hand drawn. It's, you know, um, there's, there's, um, subjectivity there but the photograph you really just see the city and and you see it how it relates to each other and and just on a day um in the past um and it's very exciting just seeing that because it's like oh there's always something interesting um even syracuse sorry there's always something interesting syracuse is a beautiful city you're muted sorry Okay. Uh, okay, that's a great uh, segue to this next question. Mitchell and I was curious to hear a little bit more about Syracuse. What is oh, sure. <laughs> so, the so, second part? Mitchell wants to hear more about what's happening in Syracuse. Yeah, absolutely. So, I can show you, I'll show you a video. One second. So, um, actually, I don't have that video handy. I have a video of the before and after of Syracuse. But, um, yes, yeah, so they are, let me pull, uh, I'll do a map at least. Syracuse. So this freeway um, starting here is going to be torn down. So the 81 is going to be designed and turned into a boulevard um, from Water Street, and I forget exactly how south, but I'm pretty sure it goes almost to the park here. Um, and so this freeway divided, so it really, it cut through the 15th Ward, which was historically the black neighbor, the heart of the black community in Syracuse, um, as well as, I forget the number of the ward, but there was a ward over here. But um, the University of Secure, the, not, you know, the Syracuse University, use eminent domain to demolish most of the neighborhood and replace it with institutional buildings and um, parking decks. 
and they now have money from the state, and I think they're getting. They have money from the governor for demolition, and I think they're getting money from the IHA too, from the 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 two the infrastructure bill. I really don't have any more info than that. Sorry, <laughs> just it, it it's 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 going forward. It's 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 a very exciting project. Um, but again, it's it's complete removal. Um, the the cities like Syracuse and Rochester, you know, they overbuilt. What, what so? What, what's interesting about those cities and also some place like Oakland is the freeways that they built were never never reached capacity. Um, they never saw the amount of traffic that they were designed to handle. So that is a different issue than places like the Cross Bronx. Uh, that does need to be removed, uh, but that that needs to be done much more carefully. Whereas these these things in Syracuse and in Rochester, they're they, they're overbuilt, um, and it, it's a direct result of that uh, uh, fifty six um, freeway bill that provided that ninety percent freeway that that pres- provided the ninety percent match. It, it, it's a, the same story of that that freeway in Oakland, the nine eighty, that connects to it. it it was meant to lead to a second Bay Bridge that was never built. Uh, it only sees something like sixty percent of the traffic it was designed to handle. Uh, there's a lot of these like low hanging fruit, uh, is what I say, sort of freeways out there that that really don't. I'm not talking about like the BQE or the Cross Bronx, uh, but like the I-10 and and Treme in New Orleans uh, that just. It's like it was a very egregious. Um, it, was, it was very obvious what they were doing. Uh, the the Congress for the new Ur- the Congress for the new urbanism is an organization um, by architect Andres Duwani. He they put out a list of um, what they call freeways without futures. So that's um, the the list of the low hanging fruit. So again, that's like Treme. That's like uh, the the Louis the in Louisville. There's one that cuts right through downtown. Um, so check out check out that that okay. list. Nine eighty is on there. Yeah, that sounds great. We we'll look more into uh, new new urbanism as a way of correcting things. Um, I'm really really sorry. Um, we're almost out of time, and I wish we could go longer. There are so many questions that we couldn't get to. My apologies to everybody on. Um, but I'm going to end with this question because I think, even though it's you know, simple, it seems it's a very good one. Liz asks, how does the recently passed federal infrastructure bill address people in cities with more racial equity? How does it do what racial, racial equity? Sorry. It's the, Infrastructure bill address rebuilding cities. Address. Um, the answer is how does it address it? It sort of addresses it. That that that's that's my answer. It let it it. I discussed this in the New York Times article. Actually, it's uh, th- there's about a billion dollars in the IIJA. So that's the that's the uh, first. That's not the Inflation Reduction Act that just passed. So that the IIJA was the um, passed a little while ago. That had a billion dollars one for reconnect for specifically addressing what I'm talking about. So that's towards projects like uh, Syracuse and Rochester, though they got state funding. Um, so that's one billion dollars for projects like that. Um, but then they also allocated 243 just to um, state DOTs. So. Uh, and and they, the state TOTs have said that they're going to mostly use it for expansion, not even maintenance expansion. There's a Bloomberg article about it, but it it doesn't. I mean, that's the it, it it's basically status quo. It's just throwing money at the problem. And one of the things that you know, I'm trying. One of the points I'm trying to make is that it's 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 this is really an institutional problem that we just keep using the same tool book to keep expanding these highways. I'm not even saying that. I'm not saying that the, and again, I'm not saying that the people who work in the DOTs are are knowingly 
being discriminatory, but they are participating in a system that was set up that way. And to just keep mindlessly expanding is racist, but it's also counterproductive. Um, but, but that's how they're, that's just how the institution is set up. You know, it's, it's, it's the fact that capital budgets are a lot easier. It, the answer is sort of, it sort of addresses it, but it could do a lot more. And then the, infl the Inflation Reduction Act basically goes all in on electric cars. Um, and electric cars are a talking point. They're not a real solution. Well, it would seem, um, and I'm going to try to talk slowly because I would love to. Uh, sorry, yeah. More, but I apologize for my connection as well. But it seems like infrastructure would also include uh, a lot of mass transit uh, element um, train, light rail, buses, things that would alleviate this or eliminate certain things. Is that okay? There, I mean, there, there was not really any money for, there was some money for transit, but it was absolutely dwarfed. I mean, it was like a drop in the bucket. Uh, it, it was, and, and the funding mechanisms for transit are just absolutely different. You know, a state DOT is able to make decisions that, a, you know, a transit agency just can't because they have to deal with a million Jurisdiction, like you know, to, you take something like BART. You know, BART doesn't even have a dedicated. It, it's just there's too many, or like Wamada in DC that doesn't even have a dedicated funding source. BART does, but BART has a million cooks in the kitchen. It's it, the it's really these are institutional problems that, and a lot of these need to be, you know, continually. They're institutional problems that again throwing continuing to throw money at it's not going to help. Um, there was some money for transit, but not nearly enough. And much of it is for capital budgets. This is a very specific point rather than maintenance budgets. And the fact of the matter is we have every transit system is not in a state of good repair. We know that in New York. Um, and they, this money, a lot of it can't even be used for maintenance. A lot of it has to be used for flashy projects but then that's not to say we don't need the second avenue subway but there's a lot of other things that need to come first great all right well thank you i love this and i wish we great. could much longer um it's a very important subject that, um, everybody i mean it, it's not everybody's job but everybody should know about it so they can doing the right thing. Uh, please, please look at the um, chat, the um, announcements there. And um, thank you so much, Adam. It was so great to have you on. Thank you so much. Yeah. And um, thanks, everybody. Check out my website. It's segregationbydesign.com. Um, and as I, I have all the images I showed, pretty high res up there. You can right click and save as if you want to zoom in. Um, yeah, so thanks everybody. Um, it was a pleasure. Sure, the next at home program.